Hasn't today been great so far? We're so happy you've joined us for our first ever COPA Community Day. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Amy Hickman, and I'm the Certification and Training Manager here at Capato. Over the next few hours, you're going to have the opportunity to learn a little more about Capato and how it works in our Fundamentals One workshop. You'll have the opportunity to get hands-on with Capato through instructor-led exercises. This workshop will not only give you more confidence in using our product, but you'll also receive a coupon code to waive your fee on your Fundamentals One certification exam. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our two workshop trainers for today, who are both from our sales engineering team. Shelly Houlihan and Cassia Wallach. And with that, happy learning. Hi everyone, I am Shelly Houlihan and I'm a sales engineer here at Copato. We are so excited to have you here at COPA Community Day, and I'm joined by... Hi, guys. I'm Cassia Wallach. I'm also a sales engineer over here at Capato with Shelly, and we're excited to walk you through Fundamentals 1 training today. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We're going to go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so as we talked about, this is Fundamentals 1. Um, we... If you're walking through this, Cassia later is going to walk through um, some hands-on exercises. If you want to be following along, we ask that you have already set up a playground, a Copato playground via our success community. If you haven't done that, don't worry about it. You're still going to get plenty of great information. And this session was designed so that you can follow along or not. So um, have that ready if you if you've already set it up, if not, don't worry about it. Like I said, you'll still learn all of the good stuff. Um, so our learning objectives for Fundamentals 1, we want to talk about what Copato is, um, give you an overview. I'm sure a lot of you already know a little bit about that, but we're going to give um, a little bit more detail. And then we're going to go through committing changes, work on our branching strategy and talk about that. Um, what promotions are and how those work, and then um, what a back promotion is. So what Copato is, we're going to look at the standard development life cycle versus um, a development life cycle within Copato. So basically why Copato makes your life so much easier. Um, and then for committing changes, we're going to look at incremental as well as full profile. Um, so you have the full gamut there. And then... Um, the branching strategy really is like a core piece of Copato, so that's important that we review. And the promotion process, what it means to promote, and best practices around that as well. And then the back promotion, that's one of my favorite features. Um, we're going to have a look at something um, that saves you the pain of having to go through a sandbox refresh, and that's the back promotion. So let's get started on what the development lifecycle with Copato looks like. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call is familiar with our Copato Academy. Um, it's modeled after Salesforce's trailhead and has different modules and exercises that you can perform. Here we see three different personas or roles that you can choose from. And we're going to dive into the admin persona today, which is most relevant to the Fundamentals 1 related actions. And we're going to go through some of the different um, key performance indicators or metrics that an admin would be measured on. So let's dive in. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of admins in the audience today. If you want, go ahead and um, you know send in the chat if you're an admin um, or if you're a developer, or release manager. You know, tell us what your role is there. Share that in the chat. We're always curious to see what the breakdown of roles is when we do these training calls. Um, sometimes it's admin heavy, sometimes developer. I imagine today we'll have a big, a big swath of variety. Um, so Amy might be Amy Hickman, who you saw at the beginning. She might be 
chiming in with um, in that chat with you. So um, a question for the admins in the audience. How do you think you are measured? Um, your manager, what are they looking for in determining whether you as a Salesforce admin is doing your job well? And if, again, if you have an idea, throw it there in the chat. We love to see those. Um, but some of the main things that we see are on this next slide. So let me pull that over. Um, effectiveness. So what the Salesforce admin is building successfully and is it solving the related business problem? How effective are you? Um, productivity. Are you producing or contributing to a lot of changes? And then finally, speed. How quickly are you able to produce those changes? So that's the three that we're going to focus on today. Again, if you want to chime in on the chat with other KPIs that you guys have seen, feel free to do that. Not a requirement, though. Okay, and then we also want to go through how we measure DevOps success. So we know you admins are getting measured, you know, developers as well. But like I said, we're focusing on the admin um, persona today. But your overall DevOps success as well. So these are what we call the four pillars of DevOps. These are key software metrics that the industry as a whole looks at. So let's go through each of these. The first one here is lead time. Um, you can think about this as from the moment you finish a feature, how long does it take to reach production? This is related back to that previous slide, your productivity and your effectiveness. So this means the shorter your lead time, the faster you, um, you get your feedback and the better your time to market is. Whether you're delivering to customers or maybe your Salesforce instance is you know, solely, your, your customers are all internal you know, business stakeholders, how fast are you able to get that out? The second is deployment frequency. How often do you release features. And really, when we talk about features, that's really how often are you delivering value um, to your production environment. So again, this is related to speed and your number of releases, for example. Um, if you release more frequently, those releases should be smaller, more incremental than if you accumulate a work, work over a longer period of time and do a bigger um, sort of mass release. So this increases the feedback loop, um, enables the team to handle smaller deployments and um, fix bugs, as well as mitigates the amount of risk of the deployment process itself. The third one is change failure rate. So how often do deployments to production fail? This is probably gonna happen, you know, uh, certainly we wanna minimize this as much as possible, but how often does that happen where your production release fails? Um, this allows us to track and really fine tune the process to ensure that there are testing measures and fail safe mechanisms um, to prevent this in the future. So that's part of what you'll hear about shifting left. You know, we're trying to get all of that stuff to happen earlier in the process so that you don't run into a production failure later on. Um, and if you were on the CRT uh, session earlier, you know, that's a lot about what they do. Getting that testing in early and often. The time for recovery is our last pillar. And this is the amount of time a production system remains down. So if you have one of those failures um, that we talked about in change failure rate, how long does it take you to get back up? And this generally has financial implications. You know, I've worked at as a Salesforce admin in previous roles, and uh, one of my companies, we were heavy CPQ users. We ran into an issue with um, a deployment, and basically none of our sales reps were able to generate quotes. And that was a core part of our business and really the probably number one thing that was done in Salesforce. So that was a major financial implication for us. It was one of those, you know, emergency, all hands on deck, get on a bridge call to fix it. So you really want to minimize absolutely your time to rec for, for recovery. Um, it's an important measure and you want to have a process in place 
to identify how to improve that time for recovery in the long run. So get it, you know, down to as short amount of time as possible. So here we can see that each of those individual key performance indicators or um, KPIs play an important role in our overall DevOps process. So for that admin, we had effectiveness, productivity, and um, speed. And then those all bubble up. You know, there's some other things that we've indicated here as other KPIs, but those all bubble up into our overall for DevOps pillars. So this is an overall measure of your DevOps success. One thing sort of dovetails with another. So things like our speed, our number of releases, um, the distribution of releases, meaning, you know, are you doing one every couple of weeks? Is it one a month or is it really sporadic and you don't know? Um, those all are gonna determine your results as a company and overall for these main DevOps pillars. Okay, so let's start to get into the challenges. Um, for us to start incorporating some of these metrics and measuring, it's a lot easier than said than done. You know, we all know that Salesforce is a unique platform that has some DevOps inhibitors or gaps that make it challenging for us to successfully implement a CI CD process. Um, if you have an idea or if you've experienced a challenge, feel free to throw that in the chat. I know. Um, probably my number one challenge in my previous role was dealing with that CPQ um, data and meta, you know, how they use data as metadata. That was probably one of my biggest headaches. Um, but things that we see often, you know, not on such a specific level as I just gave an example of, but um, some of those challenges or gaps that we see in Salesforce are lack of version control, merge conflicts, Sandbox synchronization. You know, if I can't work sync my working environments, how am I going to predictably release something? Um, automated deployments or lack thereof, I should say. And then manual overhead. Um, that all contributes to your deployment frequency. And then no ability to roll back. So um, remember, that's basically your mean time to recovery that we were talking about on the previous slide. I think of the rollback as like an undo button. <laughs> if you have um, a release that goes bad, there's no way to, you know, easy button undo like there is um, in so many applications that we're used to. So that usually becomes manual overhead. Again, that's contributing to your mean time to recovery. So in order to overcome these challenges, there are a variety of tools out there that will partially help you. I'm sure a lot of you have run into this. We've mentioned a few um, or, you know, we've all probably seen a handful of these before, whether it's um, Jenkins or change sets, um, Salesforce DX, you know, these things get you part of the way there, but there hasn't really been a full-fledged solution until you get to Kapato. So that's why today we're going to see how Kapato can help with handling all of these challenges. Here's the situation that we are all in. We all have these Salesforce specific obstacles and inhibitors at the bottom. So you'll see here's all our challenges. Um, and they affect your individual KPIs, which are in the middle section here, those dark blue ones. Um, and then ultimately that's gonna roll up to your organization to define the end results for your company's DevOps performance metrics. So it's important what we do how we do it, um, and that we ensure that we're measuring all along the way so we can continue to improve that process. So again, all these things are dovetailing. We're seeing the challenges. Those are relating to your um, KPIs there in the middle, and then those are relating to your DevOps pillars. Here at Copado, we want to help with this journey. We want to get you to true DevOps success, as the slide says. So um, Copato is a native application to Salesforce that was designed to solve all of these nuances that are involved with implementing DevOps on the Salesforce platform. So things we touched on before, right? No version control, no automated testing, an inability to keep environments consistently in sync. The list goes on and on, but these are all areas where uh, Copato can help. And we're going to get into um, what this diagram means, but this is where our branching strategy comes into play a little bit later. 
So here we see an overview of some of Kripato's capabilities that respond to these challenges we're talking about. So things like automated quality checks and deployments, um, semantic conflict resolution engine. So this is giving us a way to manage those merge conflicts. Um, and you get a heads up of those so that you can be alerted. You know, it's not we're deploying to production. Oh, there's a merge conflict. It's hey, when you deploy to production, you're going to have this issue. So we're alerting to you um, that early and then giving you a way to resolve that right there within Copato. Back deployments and org synchronization. So we touched on that a little bit before, keeping those sandbox um, environments in sync so that you're not having to deal with a sandbox refresh, which we all know can be a huge pain. Um, so being able to back deploy um, things that have come from other sandbox and syncing that over to um, sort of those parallel sandboxes so that everything has the most up-to-date data. Everybody can be working on, you know, what's fresh and new and not calling or slacking and saying, hey, you deployed that page layout story and um, I don't have that. And can you, can I copy that over to my environment? You know, none of that. You can do a back deployment and avoid, avoid all of that pain. Um, and then compliance and monitoring, monitoring, excuse me, you want to have that traceability and insight. Um, you know, that's just a given in today's world. Everybody wants to see what's happening, when it happened. We're so used to that with Salesforce, with things like last modified dates and owners. So um, you want to be able to leverage that with your DevOps platform as well. And because um, Copato is native to Salesforce, all of these capabilities are in a UI that allows collaboration between admins and developers and release managers. So if you're an admin and you really like to be in the UI, hello, awesome admin here, um, you can do that. If you are a developer and you love VS Code, you can do that and com connect Copato um, and use it, the command line interface like you like. And then a release manager who's sort of spanning the two, um, you know, or sort of the go-between, they're going to be able to do that as well. So everyone's happy in Copato. You all get to live in the place you like. Oh, my goodness. Those were supposed to be paused. Sorry about that, guys. Um, okay, so taking user stories to the next level. Copato is a user story-centric model. And what we mean by that is we take a more agile or flexible approach to your DevOps process. So in Copato, we have a custom object labeled the user story. And this user story object actually performs double duty for us. Not only does it contain all of our requirements to create changes, things like functional and technical specifications. What is this story actually doing? You know, am I um, adding a new pick list field? Am I building out a new Apex class? Whatever those technical specifications are. But secondly, it's also going to act as our container where we're going to commit the metadata directly to that user story. So say I'm building out a new process builder. I write that out. I need to build a new process builder in my user story. But then I'm going out into my developer sandbox, I build out that process builder, and then I use the user story as a container for the metadata for that process builder. So it functions on two levels. Um, user stories establish a direct relationship between a change and its functional requirement. So just think of that. It's like the bridge between the two. These stories can be bundled together into a larger deployment, deployment um, but one of the reasons why the user story model is so effective is because it gives you the ability to pick and choose, um, be selective, group, or you can even decouple, um, you know, untie two different things. Um, the user stories each time they want to be deployed. So if you have some things that are re ready in this release, your other, you know, my teammate Cassia said she had some stories. We thought they were going to go together. Um, the business stakeholders changed their mind. We need to sort of decouple those two stories. We can do that easily. Cassia's can remain back. We can go ahead and deploy mine forward. Um, it's really easy to pick and choose, um, make those incremental changes as needed. And then on the other side of that, we can easily group things together and deploy a bunch of things at once. So things like, again, if um, one story hadn't passed testing um, would be another example of something needing to be held back. 
So you're getting a more modular deployment process that's very nimble and flexible, allowing you to respond to changes that may arise. You know, you're not stuck in like a steady railroad pattern where as soon as you deviate, it's a major thing. You can respond to those um, changes as they come up. And we all know the business changes, changes their mind. Things don't pass testing. You know, those changes happen. So we want to be flexible and accommodate for that. Okay, so here's, we touched on this earlier about um, branching strategy, but I really wanna talk about this because it is an important part of Copato. Um, Copato is going to enable your team to utilize version control by automating, auto, <laughs> automatic, automating your branching strategy. So this means that while you and your team can use point and click Salesforce navigation, again, awesome admin, that's me, point and click, um, to do all, and we're living in Salesforce in our point and click world. All of the branching related actions for version control are going to be done automatically by Copato on the back end. So I don't have to get into version control. I don't have to mess with Git. Copato is taking care of that all for me, which is a big weight off my shoulders. I don't have to um, go in and learn a whole new tool. I get to just live in Salesforce. But that being said, let's do quickly review what this branching strategy looks like so you all understand what Copato is doing in the back end for you. On a very high level, looking at this slide, we can see that each org, so you can see production, UAT, and dev um, here on the right, has a corresponding, whoops, sorry guys, I got a little click happy there. Um, so here are your orgs, your Salesforce orgs on the right. Each of these is having a corresponding branch over on the left, um, and that's in your Git repo. So master or main, it's sometimes called, corresponds to prod, UAT and dev with each of those sandboxes. Um, and then each time a story has metadata added to it, a feature branch is created that contains those changes. So this is what we were just talking about um, a slide or two back, that that user story is a container for the metadata changes as well as a list of the functional requirements. Um, so that user story gets metadata added. Um, we're going to create a feature branch corresponding to that user story in that branch. So as the feature branch is deployed throughout the pipeline, the org branches will also update to reflect the new changes. So you can see there's like user story one is here, user story two is here. These are all branching off of master in purple. Anyway, the overall main point that we want to emphasize is that you don't need to have command line interface or CLI experience with Git commands to get the benefit of version control. Just know this is happening in the back end for you, but you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to touch it. Copato will do that for you. Okay, so we've touched on this briefly again before um, about keeping orgs in sync, but let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, this is one of the most common, common pain points that we hear from prospective and current customers um, that come up in our discussions with companies. People don't like having to refresh their sandboxes all the time. Um, I know a lot of people do it maybe once a year or maybe only when, um, you know, it's just such a pain in the, in the behind. So um, we're trying to avoid that pain, right? We're trying to solve that pain. When you do refresh a sandbox, there are all these post refresh steps that you have to do, loading test data, dealing with the environment variables or values that have to be dynamic. Um, Copato allows you to take the user stories that have been deployed up to production. So, you know, use your diagram here for visual aid. Oh my God, <laughs> don't click on anything, geez. Um, Hi, you guys. Welcome to a live community day where I click too much and advance the slides. Okay, so we're talking about changes that have gotten deployed up to production. We can then back deploy that work all the way down into the rest of these sandboxes. So let's say that something was built in Dev1. It got deployed up to um, integration, UAT, production, but the Dev2 and 3 sandboxes don't yet have those changes. Normally, to get those changes into those parallel, you know, lower dev sandboxes, we would have to do a production refresh or a sandbox refresh, I should say, to get the data from production down. 
With Copado, you can do these back promotions. So you can push everything back down so that now Dev 2 and Dev 3 have exactly the same as Dev 1. Everything's in sync. So you're working with the latest changes. Um, and thinking back to the branching strategy, that same feature branch that was deployed up the pipeline is getting moved back down. So again, that's what's happening in the back end. Copado's doing it for you. Let's go to the next slide. This is why someone, someone else should probably control my slides, you guys. I should not be trusted with this mouse. Um, okay, so when we look at continuous integration, Copado has a few great features to enable a true CI. We're going to be able to continuously track changes in both Salesforce and the Git repository. So again, you're getting um, the best of all worlds. And that's going to enable that incremental and fast deployment, both forward and backward. So whether you're going from dev up to production, or like we just talked about on this previous slide and needing to do a back promotion from production down to dev two, for example. And then on the continuous delivery side, um, we're getting changes to production safely, quickly and sustainably. So you can be fast, anybody could be fast, right? Um, anybody can speed down the highway as fast as they want, but you want it to be safe. You want it to be sustainable. You don't want to just deploy any old thing. So that's where um, safe, safety and sustainability is really important. So Kobato can be set up to automate a number of your DevOps related tasks, including testing, validating, and even deploying. As you continue to collect data on your KPIs, and process, you can automate more and more of your process as you identify those bottlenecks. So you really can get smarter about your process as you go and faster because you automate more. Okay, so building off of that, Copado, because Copado is in um, native to Salesforce and all the actions that are performed are logged on custom objects and fields, you know, we're doing everything in version control, but where we really love to be is in Salesforce, right? Um, we, because everything is logged in Salesforce, we then have the ability to pull and create great metrics and insights for our DevOps process. So again, identifying those bottlenecks or issues. Um, Copado users can leverage Salesforce reporting capabilities in tandem with the data points um, collected by Copado surrounding your DevOps process. So this is going to enable you to iterate on your process and continue to improve and evolve. And again, it's all things that you're used to, building reports, leveraging dashboards. Um, and then if you want to get into a real fun, um, you know, an analysis sort of thing, we have a, something called the Compliance Hub that's really fun to look at. We're not going to talk about that today, but I do like to mention it because it is a good one if you're into metrics. Okay, we're going to do a quick knowledge check. Everybody loves a pop quiz, right? Um, so what is true about user stories? They can be assigned to multiple developers. Users establish, sorry, user stories establish a direct relationship between a change and its functional requirement, or only admins can delete user story records. So go ahead and reply in the chat with your answer. And I know we have a lot of awesome folks on the call today, but everybody's gonna get this right. But I'll give you a minute to chime in there. And then, um, We'll jump right back into it. Ooh, Cassia says we have a correct answer. Are we getting a lot? Let me jump over to comments. Yes, everybody is chiming in with two. Good job. I see. I haven't jumped over to comments, you guys. It's hard to drive and chat and do all the things. Everybody got it right. So yes, user stories are establishing the direct relationship between a change and its functional requirements. So remember, um, it's going to be a container for your metadata, but it's also going to act as um, a list of your functional or technical specifications. Good job. Gold star, everyone. Sorry, I should have advanced to this slide when we were talking about the answer. But yes, number two is the right one. Okay, so committing to a user story, we're going to do a demo. So it's time to get hands on. You're gonna have to 
peel away from me and I'm gonna let Cassia jump in and she's gonna take you through this section. Awesome. Thank you. This might take just a minute with our platform here, but we'll get um, Cassia on and you guys will get a break from me <laughs> and my happy clicking. Mouse control is, is hard, Shelly. I think you did a great job. All right, hello. Can Shelly, can you hear me? We might be having a slight technical. Um, Cassie, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, I am. Okay. We're working on it. Here we go. Okay, let me can you hear me, Shelly. Stop my screen and I'm gonna pass over to Cassia. All right, tech check. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, as Shelly mentioned, we're going to walk through a hands-on exercise, a day in the life of an admin, if you will. Um, actually, let me bring up the slide that marks sort of like the flow of what we're going to be doing today. Or I can just post it in the chat. I'll do that. Just give me a second. Amy, I'm going to send you the walkthrough. Can you post that in the broader chat, please? So yeah, so as I mentioned today, we're going to be acting um, as an admin, and we're going to be making some declarative changes in two different sandboxes. So we're going to pretend to be two different admins, making our changes. Then we're going to create a user story to accommodate the changes in the two different sandboxes, and then deploy those changes up through your pipeline. Um, and so what you see before you on my screen is our Capato Success community. So a prerequisite for being able to follow through with these exercises will have been to come in and actually create a playground. So I'm just going to show you how to get there from the Capato Success community. Again, if you haven't had the chance to do this, just follow along um, visually and you can always come back, listen to the recording and walk through it after the fact. So um, I'm again in success.cafato.com. We're going to go to training, my playgrounds. And then you can see that I have one that I've created. It's full configuration with scratch orgs, which means that Capato is going to drum up an entire pipeline for you, including all of the sandboxes you need. It's going to install the managed package, and you're going to be good to go start playing around with it. So also from this screen, I can log into all of my orgs. Here's my Capato production. So this is where Capato is actually installed and the org where you're going to be making your user stories and managing your DevOps flow. And then down here, we have all of our sandboxes. Um, production is also a sandbox. This is just for you know, your, your training purposes. We've added it into the pipeline as an additional Scratch org. So um, I think that the flow has been posted in the comments. Again, we're going to be logging first into Dev1 creating an object called guest and creating a few different fields on that object. Then we'll create a user story for that within Capato, um, promote and deploy that story, and then repeat the process from Dev2. So I'm just going to jump into this. Um, maybe we'll go through a quick overview of sort of what Capato looks like once it's installed first. But please feel free to ask any questions in the chat, um, or if I'm going too fast, which I do tend to do. Just you know, put a hand up, tell me to slow down, and um, I will take that feedback. And yeah, slow down a little bit. So what I just did is I clicked on our uh, production org link from within the success community. And again, this is going to be where Capato is actually installed. Um, Capato is a managed package, so it's just going to be installed into your production org or production level org, and it's going to act, and that org will act as sort of the air traffic control center where you can control your, your DevOps processing, your, your deployment flow across all of your environments. So right now we're looking at the pipeline manager, which is just showing all of the environments in one production stream and then how they're connected. So this is the um, pipeline that will be automatically set up from within your playground. We have two dev sandboxes merging up to UAT and then going straight up to production with our hotfix here for any you know quick changes that we do need to go back into production. So let's go ahead and start making those changes in our Dev1 sandbox. Uh, to do that, I'm going to open up my Dev1 sandbox by locating my email with Dev1 appended to it and clicking open. 
And this will open up that particular sandbox org, hopefully. There we go. And so right now we're going to be creating our guest object. And then we will be creating two fields, first name, last name. Um, we're going to uncheck field level security and then go ahead and move these changes. So I'm going to move through this, assuming that most of you, if you're admins, et cetera, have you know, some fami familiarity with navigating through Salesforce setup. I've just clicked on setup, going to object manager, and then go ahead and follow the instructions in the comments to create your custom object. Okay, I'm going to say this is deployed. And now I'm going to go ahead and create my fields. Mm -mm. First name. What's a good length for a first name? I think 30 is plenty. Um, I'm going to uncheck field level security for now. This is just because um, if we do you know, enable field level security, we're going to have to also deploy all of the profiles that we've updated with the new ability to see our field. And so just for ease of our first user story, we're just going to take the profiles out of the picture for now. Um, however, we will add it to our guest layout. So we're going to have to deploy this layout as well because it now has a new field on it. So, so what we're deploying so far as a part of this build is going to be um, our guest object, our first name field and our last name field, and then our page layout, which we have added our new fields to. So I'm just going to create my last name field very quickly. Give this one 50. Some people have very long last names. If anyone has a 50 character last name, please post it in the chat. I'd be curious to see it. Yeah, who? let's play a little game. Who has the, long <laughs> who has the longest name? last name? Because <laughs> Wallach and Houlihan aren't quite cutting it. Although I really like the last name Houlihan. I think it's cool. <laughs> Okay, so speed check. I've done my first build. So I've created a custom object in Dev1 and I've created two fields on it, first name and last name, unchecked field level security and added them both to the page layout. Is this an okay, okay speed so far? Are we getting any? Okay, looks like we're okay. So my next step here is going to be to create a user story in um, our Capato org to then relate these changes that I've just made to, and as Shelly was walking us through, use this user story that we create as a vessel to deploy these changes throughout the pipeline. So I'm um, logged back into my Capata org. You can see we're back on our pipeline manager. Um, I am a, con a diehard console user, so I'm gonna be navigating through this in console, but um, I believe there's just a regular Capato app, um, Capato. Just like the regular Capato release manager app um, could also do the trick if you are console averse. But what I'm going to do from console is, ah, what is happening? Go away. <laughs> there we go. Interesting. Go to our user story object, just like any other object. So when you install Capato, there's a handful of objects that are included in the managed package. They are just regular custom uh, Salesforce objects. Um, the great thing about the fact that Capato is innate to Salesforce means that you can continue to build on and customize these objects and these layouts. And so just to, like if you don't want to keep the page layout or the flexi page that comes out of the box, you can always make updates to those layouts. So this isn't like the final end all version of your layout if you do not want it to be. But I'm going to create my user story with a user story record type. We'll call this guest object dev one. And there's a few fields that I have to populate on this user story in order for it to be effective as a deployment vessel. So the first um, crucial field that you need to populate is going to be project. Your project record is going to link this user story to the pipeline that you want applied to it so that the flow is 
predefined for you um, when you're creating this. So I think there's a, a pre-created project that should be drummed up already for you in your um, in your playground. It's going to be called Capato Playground, logical. So just make sure that you input that project into the project. And then the, the last field that's crucial to fill out at this point is going to be the org credential field. This is indicating which sandbox you are making those initial changes in. Capato is going to automatically update it as the story is deployed throughout the pipeline. But this is going to indicate to Capato where it needs to look for those changes when we're first doing that first commit. And also, at what point in the pipeline is this story existing? Very unlikely that we would create a story, you know, not at the lowest level sandbox, but um, you know, stranger things have happened. So we're going to go ahead and input dev one for this particular story. And that's actually all that I'm going to have to fill out. I mean, this is where we would, you know, add your agile content, your user story here, um, all of your functional and technical specifications. Again, you can add um, any number of fields, sections to this layout as you see fit. But as far as, you know, needing this to be a functional user story record, um, these are the three really crucial fields. So title, project, and credential. And I'm going to click save. So at, right off the bat, you can see that Capato has gone ahead and defined our deployment flow right here on the record. And this is, again, based on those connections that we saw on our pipeline manager. So dev1, TUAT to production. That's going to be reflected on your user story. Um, this user story is linked to that pipeline, again, by our project. And again, we've added our dev1 credential in so that when we actually commit our changes, Capato knows where to look for those components. So just taking a pause. I'm going to check to make sure everyone is doing OK. OK, it looks like we don't have any comments. So I'm assuming that silence is golden here. And I'm just going to yeah. sing on. Everybody's good. good. Sorry to chime in here. Everybody's great. OK, cool. Awesome. So yeah, we're going to, once you've done this, you've inputted you know, your crucial information on your story. We're going to click Commit Changes here um, on the user story record. And this is going to open up the Capato Elevated Change Set. Um, it's going to open up our commit grid. And this grid, which you can see right here, is going to contain every piece of metadata from the environment that you indicated on your user story. I do want to call out here, um, we've Capato has recently um, you know, released a lot of released a lot of new features. Um, and we're working on getting that newer package automatically installed into our playgrounds. Um, so for right now, you are going to have to probably refresh your metadata in order to see the most recent custom object you've created. But once you do install the new package, or if you were to become a Capato uh, client, this step would be necessary. Capato is going to automatically detect the brand new metadata, and it's going to put it right on top of your metadata grid. So just calling that out. This is sort of an additional step that does need to be taken um, just because it's a playground that we generated. Yeah, so more functionality soon to come in the playground. Yes, absolutely. So from here, I'm going to select um, the components that I changed. There's a number of different sort, search, and filter capabilities available to us from here. Um, for example, I could search by the type of metadata. So maybe I want my custom field, because I have two. We have right at the top now, guess last name and first name. And then I want a custom object. And then what else? I wanted a page layout. Uh, hey, or is it just layout? There it is. And as I select these components that I want to commit to the story, they're going to appear here on a selected metadata tab where I can come through and do a final review before actually committing those changes. So I know I used to use, use um, change sets quite a bit prior to coming over to Capato. Um, had to you know go through and select one component type by component type. And if I click to the next page, my selections would disappear. It was definitely like a very long and arduous sort of process. And so I'm a huge fan of this metadata grid. Also, as Shelly was mentioning during her presentation, we do have a Capato CLI so that if you are more of a dev user and you don't want to start using this interface, you can still 
um, you know, initiate all of your commit actions from the IDE of your choice while your admin users are maybe more comfortable using point and click and using this grid. So just because um, you do adopt Capato if you were to, it doesn't mean that as a dev, you have to completely reconfigure your process. But for admin users, such as like more myself and Shelly, uh, the ease of use is going to increase quite a bit. And so at this point, we're going to actually commit these changes to our story. So I'm going to click commit changes. And while we're waiting, um, this is where this is the first point in the process where Capato is going to automate all of those version control actions under the hood without you ever having to leave Salesforce. So that's what's occurring right now. Um, Capato is going to create and this might be a little too technical. I, I do think you have to know sort of basic branching strategy for Fundies one. So if you can try to retain could be um, helpful. But what right now Capato is creating a feature branch in your Git repository and you're every user story is going to have their own feature branch, which is just going to contain the changes that are encompassed by the components that we just selected. So this feature branch is going to contain, you know, just like the master org metadata plus the changes that we just committed to the story for that guest object, our two new fields and the layout. Sometimes I think of it, um, I don't know, my brain works in analogies sometimes. So if this helps somebody else, I'm going to embarrass myself and type in. I think of sometimes like the user story record being in Salesforce and that houses the metadata in the functional requirements like we talked about. And the analogous to that is in Git, there's a feature branch. So it's sort of like a user story in Salesforce, a feature branch in version control. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to remain true as the story is deployed up the pipeline and as that feature branch, you know, is deployed up the pipeline, but in the repository, it's going to be reused as it's merged into all of the different org branches, just as this user story, you know, moves up the pipeline from dev to production. And Cassia, we do, if we can take a quick beat, we do have a couple of questions okay. come in. Yes. Um, Melissa has asked, where do you look to see the history of what changes were committed? That is a great segue question. And Melissa, let me know if this answers um, your question, but so on the Git side, we've created a feature branch or Capato has under the hood um, without any intervention from you or your admin users. Then on the Salesforce side, Capato will have created a commit record as a child record to the user story. Um, and this is gonna act as an audit log of, you know, when these changes are being committed by who. We can also see a running list of the metadata encompassed across the commit records in this user story metadata related list. So this is calling out those four specific pieces of metadata that we have committed our layout, our fields, and our object. The siren at Cassia's house. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, Melissa, just reply in comments or chat if that did not answer your question. And Gaurav, I'm working on a um, private answer to you. Thanks, okay. Cassia. Okay. Awesome. So we've committed. We've created our changes. Committed our changes. Um, at this point, there's a handful of other steps that we could take that are, um, they're more tailored to actually on our second certification. So, you know, at this point you could run your tests, um, you could run a validation deployment, you could create a pull request, et cetera. But for the sake of today's declarative changes, we're just going to go ahead and mark this as promote and deploy to kind of initiate this deployment of the story. So. There's two sort of methods that you can take to deploy a story. Um, and we have two check boxes in our, oh, there you go, deployment options um, in this section on the user story record. So I'm just going to talk through these quickly, and we're going to use both of them today. So promote and deploy is going to be used if you want to automatically launch a promotion deployment of a story right from the user story record. It's going to be deployed um, individually, so you're not going to have the chance to lump it in with other user stories uh, from the pipeline and deploy them in tandem. This is maybe, you know, you just need, you've just made a quick change, you need it up the pipeline now, you could mark this promote and deploy um, and Capato will do the rest. So we're gonna start by doing this, um, marking this as promote and deploy. And then while this story is making its way up to UAT, we'll go log into Dev2, create our second object and kind of repeat this process. So go ahead and mark your first story as promote and deploy. And again, this is going to automatically initiate that promotion deployment up to UAT. And while we wait, let's go back into our playground, open up Dev2, 
and um, create that second object. Okay, so here I am in Dev2. And I'm, I know everyone probably knows how to do this, but I'm just talking into quiet right now, so I'm narrating. Um, we're going to go ahead and create another custom object. This one will be called Room. Kind of have a hotel theme going on here. It's kind of like you're reading us a story, Cassia. I like that. <laughs> like story I know, time. Story time with Cassia. <laughs> Every time with Kaz. Uh, does not start with a vowel. <laughs> okay. Oh, and then I think we wanted actually our name to be an auto number rather than a text field. So we'll say room name, sure. Display format, room name. And we'll start with zero. We'll start with one. <laughs> I guess you can have a room zero. And then I'm going to say save. And I believe we had another couple fields to add to this. OK, so we have number and description. OK, so just like last time, I'm going to create two new custom fields. Mixing it up a bit, we're going to do a number for room number. I'm assuming we're not going to have an 18 digit room number. So this is just because I'm a little bit intense about realis realism, but OK, decimal place is 0. Next. Again, we're going to remove our field level security, add it to our layout, and then I'm going to just click Save and New to open up the creation of our second field. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, I think she wanted. Did you ever have those days as an admin where you just built fields all day long? <laughs> Don't remind me. <laughs> Sometimes I liked it. Like it was sort of almost like a brain break. You're like, Dude, that's actually very <laughs> true. You just like put on a podcast, make some, yeah. make some fields. Build out a custom object. Here we go. Build them all out. <laughs> Make the layout. OK, so I've finished my development in Dev2. Uh, created my object. We have room number. We have description. They've been added to the layout. Field level security has been removed. So um, we're going to just go through that same process that we just went through, uh, creating a second user story, inputting project, and then our environment as, or sorry, our org credential is Dev2. And then I'm going to commit it. And I'm going to do this in silence to see if anyone remembered how to do it the first time through. But again, any questions, just ask them in the chat. Okay. I know I said I was going to be quiet, but I am going to commit my changes. <laughs> I like it, Cassia. Again, story time with cats. We're at the library. We're learning things. <laughs> thanks. I'm going to refresh my metadata again, again. Um, once we get our newest Capato edition, good to go in the playgrounds. This will not be a step that you need to take. Um, but yeah, just for today, make sure to refresh so that your new changes do pop up. You get a little extra finger exercise. Exactly. <laughs> Every little click counts. Like that is pretty much all the exercise I get. So yeah, it's like getting your steps in. How many clicks do you get today? <laughs> Let's see. We have a question. Okay. Oh, this is a great time for questions. Okay. Uh, Yatin, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. That is my best attempt. Um, Yatin says, are there any limitations or unsupported metadata types 
for the metadata grid selection in Capado? That is a wonderful question. Yeah, so we're going to support every metadata type that's on the metadata API. And Shelly, I don't know if you have access to that um, the component type matrix that sort of lists out component types on metadata API versus change sets versus, do you, you know what I'm talking about? It's in the Copado docs, right? Yeah, I think if we could actually send that in the chat, that would- Yeah, let me find it and I'll send that over. There are a few things that are not available in the metadata API, so. Yeah, I think um, this is a hard question to answer because it's sort of like open-ended, but maybe if there's a specific component type that you are, <laughs> an interesting app number of clicks I did today. Business idea, let's do it. Um, no, but Yatin, if you wanted to ask about a specific type of component, I could maybe shed more light on that right off the bat. But otherwise, Shelly's going to post a link to a matrix that lists out every single type of metadata that's supported. And again, I've selected my object, my two fields, and my layout, which I've added my fields to. So I'm committing my changes to my second user story. And while we're waiting for this commit flow, I'm just going to check in on my first user story because I want to see if it made it up to UAT. So let me make a little refresh. OK, cool. So as you can see, our first user story has successfully deployed up to UAT. Um, it's indicated right here on our deployment flow. It is also indicated in our org credential and environment fields. Capado has gone ahead and automatically updated those values to match the environment that they that the story has been most recently promoted to. So that's important to note. Um, once I'm trying to think of the the smoothest way to do this. Um, once you have sort of started waiting for your second user story to um, finish the commit, go ahead and tab back over to your first user story. And we're just going to mark this as ready to promote. It's that second promotion option. And this is not going to initiate an automatic promote and deploy up into production. But instead, it's going to make this story as available to promote in tandem with others from the pipeline manager. So I'm just going to click ready to promote. Again, this isn't going to automatically initiate anything. We're just making this available for maybe our release manager um, or whoever's responsible to doing that final push to production, that they can grab this from the pipeline manager without having to navigate to all of the different user stories and just promote it straight from there. And we're going to walk through this in just a second. And now I'm going back to my second user story, just waiting. <laughs> We have some waiting to do, so I'm going to look for any other questions. Do we have any flexibility to roll back the commit changes? Um, yes, Capado does have a rollback um, capability. It's new-ish, very cool. Um, clients are loving it. It's going to be, you can um, cherry pick specific metadata components to roll back after any promotion. It's not set up, this is sort of what I was talking about earlier as well, it's not currently available in a playground with scratch orgs configuration, so that's what you're going to be working in today. But um, Shelly, also, if you maybe wanted to send a link to the rollback like docs or maybe a, a demo or something, it is definitely a capability that Capato does provide. And um, it, in my humble opinion, I think it works quite well. It's great. It's like an undo button. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, it's cool. We're currently sending some information for Yatin um, and everyone on the metadata API. Um, and I'll dig up something on rollbacks as well. Yeah, that'd be great. OK. So my second commit has been a success. And I'm going to automatically promote and deploy this story as well um, using that promote and deploy button we used for our first story. The goal right now, um, precursor, is to get both of these stories up into UAT, mark them as ready to promote, to promote from UAT so that we can then promote them together up to production. So we're just trying to get our second user story up into UAT alongside our first user story so that we can then um, you know, create a double promotion of these stories and finish infiltrating them around your pipeline. And now we wait. 
Shelly, is there any any like pertinent information I should go through while we wait for this story? To well, one, one thing I was thinking when you were on the metadata grid is that, um, and we were talking of, through Yatin's question about um, kind of unsupported metadata types and stuff. I think it's kind of fun to make sure people know that there are some things, well, quite a few things that Copado can do that a change set can't um, and solves a lot of those pain points that um, we kind of touched on earlier. So things like profiles, I know we didn't even commit profiles at my, when I was an admin, because they were such a pain, but you can commit um, full profiles with Copado or it's smart enough to do um, what we call semantic um, merge. merge. Thank you. <laughs> um, a semantic merge so that even if you just have like Cassie has been doing with like a new field, it'll remind you, hey, add a profile or permission set so that people have access to this field. But you can also do full profile commits as well. Yeah. So sets, there's a lot of, so maybe talk about those different Git operations that are available. Yes. That's a good call. So um, commit files is what we just did. That's your pretty standard commit changes to metadata. Recommit files would be like, let's say you already did a commit and you wanted to remove one component from the commit or you made an update to um, one of the components that you've already committed. This will automatically reselect your components. So we should have, yep, it's automatically reselected these components. It's assuming, hey, there's been a change made to one of these. I could always select an additional one to add to this list or delete um, one of the components if I don't want it to still show up in my feature branch in Git. Um, if I was going to delete a component, I would just want to recreate that feature branch so that that component is fully removed. Then we have destructive changes. So if you wanted to deploy a deletion of a component and then full pro profiles and permission sets is going to deploy a full profile or permission set, but that's going to include all of your system settings, um, your object settings, your field level security, everything, so that you don't have to go through and find all of the fields where the field level security has been updated or every single page layout assignment that has been changed for that profile. This will encompass every single part of the profile and permission set, which huge, huge. It's honestly <laughs> such a huge time saver. When I used to have to do this manually, I had like these intense spreadsheets to keep track of everything that was in cha changed. And then I had to do it as a post deploy and it was, I just Here goes my Friday night. Bye. No, I just remember like making so many profile updates in production and then the profiles never aligned across all the orgs. It was just horrible. Oh, um, no. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, was, and then people are like, let's just make a new profile because it's like, <laughs> yeah. Horrible. Yeah. So, this means that your profiles are going to be totally in sync across your entire pipeline. If there's like, you know, a bunch of updates that have been made field level security wise, you can just one and done get that deployed everywhere and not have to worry about it. Um, so, that was a good call then, out. Cassie, we do have a, a good question um, from Melissa. She's asking if there's a way to have a confirmation dialog box appear on the promote and deploy button. So Melissa, are we understanding your question correctly that after you promote and deploy, you want some sort of confirmation that that indeed I, was done? I think I understand the question. Okay. So, okay. Because it is, I understand what you're saying. You, you check the box and then we're just like telling you, oh, promotion has occurred, a deployment has occurred. Um, so. This is again, this is built on Salesforce. So if you wanted to add some sort of conditionally visible component on your Flexi page that says, by the way, like a promotion record has been created, that's something that could be configured. Out of the box, we don't have anything like that. But the way you can tell is by, um, you know, after waiting a bit, a refresh will let you know that, hey, the story's moved up to UAT. Um, you can also check in the related list for the promotion records. We have a user story promotion record. Um, and you can, you know, change the fields visible here so you can see the status or the environment that it's now in. This would tell you this is in UAT. And then also you are going to receive an email every time a deployment is successful. Um, I don't have my email up, but if you're if you're doing this and your playground is linked up to your email, once the deployment is successful, you should receive an email saying, Capato, deployment complete. Um, I don't know the exact do, 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 do. <laughs> jargon that they're using, um, but those are a couple ways just not like a couple out of the box ways that you can tell but again you could do some quick config there to say like oh if a promotion record has been created as a child to the story in the last 30 minutes then pop up this box telling you that there's been a success mm -hmm. or something like that. oh okay we got clarification cassia so it oh. sounds like she's actually asking kind of the reverse is when you check that um 
could you get a message? Are you sure you want to promote and deploy? I think that could be just like a screen flow maybe. Um, I think that one that out of the box, we yeah, don't have out of the box, but out of the box, no, but again, Capato is totally built on Salesforce. So, if, um, you know, any method you would use to sort of do that checks and balances for any field, um, you could implement that same thing for this layout, but that's a good, that's a good, um, call out. Yeah. That's a fun one. Yeah. If you do that, Melissa, you should, um, share it in our community. That's yeah, let us know. a cool idea. And then Yatin was asking post recommit, there will be a new promotion, right? So if you're recommitting on a story, generally you haven't actually deployed it yet. Um, I was just showing the commit grid again as an example on this story, um, just to show the other Git operations so that you know full profiles and permission sets and the destructive changes. You're not gonna have to recommit at any, every step. Your feature branch is already created. It encompasses your changes. We're not gonna go in and mess with it after it's been deployed from dev1 up to UAT but I can see why that would be confusing. Yeah. Um, and then really quickly, once your second story is also into UAT, if you could just mark that as ready to promote so that both stories are in UAT and marked as ready to promote, that would be fantastic. And what exactly is that doing, Cassia, when you check that ready to promote checkbox? Yes, this is going to, again, make these stories available to promote in tandem with one another from our pipeline manager. So once both of your stories are in UAT and they're marked as ready to promote, go on back to your pipeline manager and then we can take it from there. Thanks for your questions, team. This makes yeah. it more fun when you chime in. So, oh, yeah, team has another one. Okay. As we encounter an Apex class error while deploying promotion to a higher environment, I fix the error and recommit. So you're fixing the error. This sounds like something we're gonna have to have like a, a conversation mm -hmm. about, but, um, if you are fixing the error, are you doing it in your higher environment? Because it seems like something that you'd want to take back to your sandbox so that it's fixed at the base level and then re-promoted up through the environment. Yeah, we can take that offline, yeah, team. That's getting a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have like a... It's, like it's a, hard to answer it in like a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we could definitely put our heads together and figure out a way to seamlessly solve that problem. But what you're looking at right now, if you are caught up, again, definitely call out if I'm going too fast. Um, back on our pipeline manager, you can see that we now have some little numbers available to us next to a handful of our environments. These numbers are always gonna represent user stories that are ready to promote from that specific environment. So we can see there's two user stories next to UAT that have been marked as ready to promote and they're ready to go up to production. We can also see that there's um, two little ones next to the both of the dev sandboxes, and those are indicating the stories that are ready to be back promoted into their respective sandboxes. So our story that we created in dev two is ready to be moved back into dev one. The story that we created in dev one is going to is ready to be moved back into dev two, and we can look at that in just a second. But to initiate our promotion up to production, go ahead and just click on the two next to um, or next to the UAT sandbox. And this is going to open up a window showing us um, the user stories that are available to be promoted up to production. Um, from here, we only have two right now, but you know this could be a, a much longer list. You can always cherry pick which stories you want to move up and which to hold behind. So you know, let's say that they were you just wanted to deploy the stories associated with a certain release, or maybe only ones that had been validated. Um, you could go through this list easily, sort by any of these columns, and then select the specific user stories that you do want to move up the pipeline. And Shelly did kind of talk about this already, but do want to call out that just because these two user stories are being, I know this is going up to production at this point, so it's sort of our last deployment, but if these two user stories have been grouped together at a lower level deployment, it doesn't mean that they have to stay in the same promotion all the way up the pipeline. You will have the ability to come in, decouple and regroup stories as needed. Um, but for the purpose of today, we're going to promote them together in one big promotion. So just make sure that they're both checked and then click promote and deploy in the upper right hand corner. And now this is going to initiate the process that's kicked off similar to how when you clicked promote and deploy from the user story, um, we're now initiating that process, but from the pipeline manager and encompassing two user stories instead of just one.
And then while we wait for this, um, let's also go ahead and back deploy our stories into our respective dev branches. So a couple of different ways we could do this. Um, we could do this in a one-off fashion by just clicking on the one um, next to one of the dev sandboxes. This would open up a very similar screen that we just saw, only difference being the direction of our promotion arrow and then the story available to back promote. But a kind of more fun way to do this and also more efficient would be to mass back promote these stories from UAT into both dev boxes at the same time. So the way that we're gonna do that is by clicking on mass back promote and this is, oh, and then you're going to select your source environment and your project, environment and project. Those two fields are always important. Um, and this is going to bring up sort of a matrix of user story by des destination environment. So you can see our two destination environments, dev one and dev two. We can see that our guest object dev one does not need to be back promoted to dev one, but it does to dev two. We can see our room object dev two does need to be back promoted to dev one, but not to dev two. Again, I could come in decide which I want to back promote where, get very granular. Um, and then once I have made those final selections, I would click back promote and deploy. And this is gonna create a promotion deployment record for each of the destinations. So we're gonna have one for dev one and one for dev two. And just like Cassia mentioned, um, when we were doing forward promotions, if you get in there and you change your mind on the, on the mass promotion and you don't, you know, you just use those check boxes and you can Again, decouple user stories or features or whatever, same as you do with forward promotions. Yes, ma'am. So we're almost, I think we've gotten these stories everywhere except for Hotfix. Let me just check on their project, <laughs> their progress. <laughs> we're all dialed into your fields. <laughs> Talking is hard. <laughs> All right, so it looks like these two user stories have both successfully made it up to production. Um, I set up some automation so that the status, I'm, I'm an overachiever, so the status updated to completed uh, when we got to production, just so that I could easier track um, the progress of my stories. Again, built on Salesforce, you can make these updates. Did you do that with a, a workflow or what did you do with? No, workflow? actually, um, this is, a, this is a good sort of sidebar, I think. I find this very useful. Um, we have a really easy way to configure the behavior that's occurring as changes are deployed. So that could be like, is are the deployments manual? Are they automatic? Are they automated on a schedule? And then also what's the behavior that occurs as far as testing and status updates go um, as those changes are deployed? So really easy to set up. All you would do is click configure pipeline um, and so this is where you can, again, decide how those deployments are being executed. The little hands mean manual. So right now all of these deployments are happening manually, but let's say that I wanted, um, I wanted all of my back deployments to hotfix to be automated. And I wanted my status to be updated to completed once we got to production, which is what I did. I would just click on the icon. Um, and this is where I can control all of that. It's super easy. If I want to update my promotion details, I have the options manual, automated, or scheduled. It's as simple as updating this um, pick list value. So I do want to keep my promotion details manual, but I want to update this to automated. I could even add in back promotion criteria. So this is just going to be formula syntax, um, like regular Salesforce formula field syntax um, on any user story field. So Maybe I only want to automate back promotions on user stories that contain this type of component or et cetera. I could easily dictate that here and then I would click save. So all I did to update that um, status manually was put completed in this user story status after promotion. Um, really cool tool. We love connection behaviors, or at least I really do. I use them very heavily. That's awesome. Um, what are, what's that called again? Those are connection behaviors connection and you just behavior. Okay. I'm going to find some resources to send you guys in the chat. Yeah. So our stories should be, um, yep. Looks like my pipeline is reflecting that really well. So you can see that our two, uh, dev boxes no longer have that one pointing back at them. So our stories have back deployed successfully. Back deployments are great. They pretty much eliminate the need for sandbox sandbox refreshes and scheduling those sandbox refresh windows, doing all those post refresh activities. 
Um, and just really allowing your team to always be working with the most recent updates so that you know it reduces chance of error and conflicts down the line. Um, and yeah, our, our, our completed stories, as we know, have made their way up to production. So the last thing I have to do to clear out this pipeline is just gonna be to back promote those stories into Hotfix. Back promote and deploy. And you can see that our promotion from production to Hotfix is now scheduled and should be completed soon. And so that was really it. That's a day in the life of, um, you know, creating and committing declarative changes uh, into Capato, into some user stories and working them up the pipeline, doing some back deployments. We even got a pipeline, um, oh my gosh, a connection behavior overview in there. So that is all um, we had to cover today on the guided trail. You know, we have some, um, we I don't do. know, um, Shelly, did you want to share the code? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's do the changeover and I'll share my screen and I will show you all the coupon code so that you can go take your Fundamentals 1 certification. I stop sharing? Mm, I don't think you should have to, let's see. Abby, if you're there, can you switch from Cassia? There we go. I didn't even have to call her out. She just did it back there. Clapping for Abby. She's our stage manager back there. Um, yes, okay, so here is our coupon code. Def um, we'll put this in the chat window as well. Amy, if you can do that for us um, so that you all can easy, easily copy paste this, um, but you're going to plug this into your um, Copato success community. So you find the, um, <laughs> talking is hard, Cassia, what happened? I, <laughs> I, can, I can show, well, I can't show because I've already, you know, taken this exam, but from your success community, uh, if you go to training, yes. and then um, academy, so training is a tab on the top, you'll click Academy, and then you want to search for the um, fundamentals. Oh, there one. we go. Oh, cool. Again, hand clap for. <laughs> <laughs> here you go. Okay, so what I did here is I went to training, Academy. Um, this opened up um, our Academy. So this is going to have all of our modules and trails that you can take. There's a ton of good stuff in here, even if they're not directly related to your um, certifications. I think if I click certifications and maintenance here, we should have our fundamentals one certification trail. So I have already completed this, but you would click on this. Let's see if there's one that I don't have in my. Instead of launch, it'll say add to cart. So you guys would click the, instead of blue launch, there's a blue add to cart button. And that's yep. what you do. You would add it to your cart and then you'd be able to check out and, you know, add that code that they've posted in the chat. I wonder it's if I have like, a... Yeah, I don't know. The CRT one, maybe? I think I um, Did you already do that? So I already in, your, in your shopping cart, if once you add that fundamentals one, there'll be a, a very clear um, field for a coupon code. And that's where you'll copy paste the coupon code from today's session. And then um, when you click checkout, you'll see it's $0 instead of $250. It is very um, intuitive if you've ever online shopped and used a, a promo code, yes. then you will know how to do it. Yeah, the same as our, our beloved online shopping experience. Um, <laughs> instead of a discount on shoes or whatever, you're getting education, you guys. So um, you will have, I think this code is active for, usually we only keep these active for 24 hours. This one I think is active maybe for a week, but um, I would say go in there and punch it in as soon as possible. That doesn't mean you have to take the exam right away. We just want you to go ahead and redeem that code so you don't lose out on this $250 savings. Um, but then you'll have a couple of months at least. Um, Amy, if you're there, type in the chat how long. I think you get at least a couple of months to take your actual exam. But redeem the code as, as soon as you can just so you don't lose out on that. Um, and then I did want to show you all, we have some resources. Um, Cassie was mentioning these. 
But this is all again in the success community, success.copato.com. So the certification guides are really good. There's one for fundamentals one. So as you guys are preparing to take that exam, um, there's just like you're used to with Salesforce cert um, guides, it gives you an indication of the percentages of each category of Copato functionality that will be covered in the exam. So it's 20% on user stories, stuff like that. Um, the training calendar just gives you um, days and times of all of our upcoming workshops and cert days. So if you want to do fundamentals two or um, uh, what's the other one? Consultant certification, go ahead and check out that calendar. Sometimes we have fun ones that are geared towards certain groups of people like veterans or we did, Cassia actually did one in the UK that was all moms, right? Was that what it was? It was, <laughs> it was for super moms training. That's super it, yeah. moms. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> sometimes there's... <laughs> Um, and then the discussion groups, I know Yatin had posted that scenario that he had run into. Those are um, the sorts of things that are really good to post in the community. It's just like the sales, um, sales I almost said sales blazer, <laughs> Salesforce trailblazer community where you can post questions and answer other people's questions and make new friends. Same idea. Um, so Go and check all of those out and, um, you know, become a super Copato community member, a hero. We have heroes like Salesforce has MVPs. So get in there, make friends, ask questions. Everybody's really supportive. So it's a nice environment. Um, I'm going to put up that coupon code one more time just so that everybody can get that. Um, I think Amy copy pasted it. Yes. So scroll up in the chat. Moderator Amy put in that Copa Day um, coupon code. And that's everything for today. Cassia, did you have anything you wanted to wrap up on? No, I think we covered it. Um, happy studying and good luck on your certifications. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for joining us for Story Hour. Wasn't the workshop great? Kudos to Shelly and Cassia for leading us through it and, and having fun at that too. And thank you so much for joining us for our first ever COPA Community Day. If you want to participate in more learning, again, as the slide just recently showed, head over to success.capato.com to join our community and to stay apprised of future upcoming events. And once again, thank you for joining us for our first ever COPA Community Day. Have a great day.